Good evening all, I'm Elder Harris. Uh, it's time again for another quick, powerful, sharp study. Uh, we are still in the Gospel of John. We're gonna continue on uh, with chapter six. Today, we're going to cover verses 41 through 51, and uh, we'll get the final episode of the final installation of John chapter six in a subsequent video. Uh, first, I wanna thank all of you all for your prayerful support, uh, for your uh, reports of encouragement because they've encouraged me. I uh, ask that you would continue to uh, pray for uh, my wife and I as we continue to uh, push forward with what the Lord would have us do in this particular ministry and in others being obedient to him. Thank you so much for your support. Every kind word that has uh, come back, we appreciate it as encouragement. That being said, let's keep going with uh, John 6. Our last video uh, of John 6 covered all the way through uh, verse 40. And I want to recapitulate what's happened in John 6 up to this point. So starting off with a recap, I'm going to attempt to speak and work uh, the PowerPoint at the time. So I ask that you would be uh, patient with me uh, as I attempt to multitask. Um, so th the recap of John chapter 6 verses 1 through 40 would have us start off with Jesus trying to get away from uh, the hustle and bustle of ministry with his disciples and in trying to get away, the, the crowd follows him. And uh, it, it was actually at the time of the Passover feast. Um, according to John chapter six, verse four, it was the Passover feast season. And that's important because one, it gives us a timeline with regard to Jesus' ministry. And two, the Passover feast, we know as a Jewish feast, it holds a lot of symbolism and the predominant symbolism that we will continue to visit during this uh, series of teachings and specifically in Jesus' sermon, his, his words in John chapter six are symbolism with regard to bread because the Passover feast was a feast in which the Jews ate unleavened, that is to say unyeasted bread unleavened and unyeasted bread was symbolic of uncorrupted bread that was pure. Um, of course, this was put across in Exodus 12 as a command, and in Exodus 12, you'll also find the beginning of the institution of what we call the Passover feast, when the Jews were liberated from Egyptian slavery. But verses 1 through 15 of John 6, uh, they start off with Jesus feeding the 5,000 men at least, so over 5,000 people with the five loaves of bread, five barley loaves and two fish. Uh, and, and then uh, he, he feeds all these people. There's that miracle, we covered that in a previous video. By the time we get to verses 16 through 21, we're looking at Jesus' disciples after this grand miracle of which they were a part and of which they had a, a, a part in uh, because they actually passed out the food. The disciples were found in a deadly storm that same night. And so after being used by God, they were found without Jesus, following Jesus' orders to cross over the sea and contrary winds stirred up a tremendous and deadly storm. Well, within that storm, they found that Jesus could not only walk on water, but once one brought Jesus into the boat during any storm, they were immediately at their destination that they wanted to go to. The other gospels also record that by the time Jesus came in the boat and the boat was immediately at the land, that the wind, that contrary wind had ceased. So just accepting Jesus, the disciples were in a near-death experience on the water and they realized that accepting Jesus into their, their personal space, into their place was the remedy for a deadly storm. Well, verses 22 through 26 of John chapter six begin to talk about the following morning. The following morning, while Jesus was with his disciples, having been received into the boat, and arrived at the other side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, we find that there were folks that ate of the fish and the bread miracle the day prior that came looking for Jesus the following morning and couldn't find him. They're searching for Jesus along the shores and they had to track him down because they left where Jesus was. They were parted from Jesus. So they basically had to track Jesus, get in boats, look at footprints. Uh, you know, they're looking for any signs of where Jesus is. They actually had to get in boats and follow him across the, the Sea of Galilee so that they can find where he was. And when they get to him, they ask, where and when did you get here? We've been trying to find you. And Jesus begins to call attention to the fact that these people weren't following Jesus because they fully saw or understood the miracle. 
they were following Jesus, that is to say, tracking him down so that they could stuff their gut. Wait, let me, let me rephrase. Because whenever they got the miracle of the fish and the miracle of the bread, they ate. So it wasn't about the miracle for them. It was about what the miracle produced. The miracle showed Jesus' power. Jesus' power was manifested by making food, bread, and fish. And these people were really just after more food completely either oblivious or unconcerned about the fact that Jesus took two fish and five barley loaves and fed over 5,000 people. Jesus calls attention to that. He says, you're not worried about the miracle. You're just worried about this food, like physical food. And in verses 27 through 29, uh, Jesus is uh, he's telling these people that their, their efforts are misplaced. Their labors are misplaced. They spend a lot of effort and labor and um, uh, a whole lot of thought space trying to track Jesus down so that Jesus could feed them food again, so they can get another uh, uh, outside picnic, so that they could tailgate again and get a free lunch giveaway. Um, but Jesus is saying that their efforts and their, uh, their toil, their, their thought space should be committed to getting a type of food that doesn't perish just over time. Bread that's not going to mold and fish that's not going to go bad if left out in the sun so long. So when Jesus says that they need to labor for a different type of meat or different type of food, these people, verse 29, um, Jesus starts to talk about this, this godly work. And, and when Jesus says labor different, they want to know, well, what type of labor should we do? What type of work should we do? Still in our recap of John chapter 6, verses 1 through uh, 40. And Jesus says, okay, now you're asking a good question. And he answers them very pointedly. Let me quote this. Jesus says in verse 29 of John 6, this is the work. This is the work. This is the labor. This is the effort you should be putting forth. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent, that you believe on the person that God has sent. Jesus, of course, speaking about himself. And uh, by the time we get to uh, verse 29 and about this believing on whom God is sent, their response to this, and Jesus saying, believe on the person who God has sent, their response is, okay, you want us to believe, we want you to show us some proof, some more proof. And then they begin to pick out something that they feel like would be good enough evidence for them to believe Jesus at his word. Humans do that all the time. They decide, I'm going to reserve my belief. I'm going to reserve my commitment to God until he does something that fits my liking, specifically, until he does something that caters to what I like. Well, here, what they had suggested to Jesus in suggesting something to Jesus as if he were a wedding singer, something like, you know, just uh, putting out a song so that Jesus can uh, press a button and, and, and like a vending machine, give you your selected item. To them, in their thinking, if Jesus were to recreate an Old Testament miracle, that is what they're posing would be adequate proof for them to believe on Jesus. So let's recap that Old Testament miracle instance real fast. So we are recapping the beginning of recapitulating the beginning of uh, John 6 verses 1 through 40. Let's very quickly review what we saw in Exodus 16 in a previous study because it's pertinent to this study. Now, the miracle that these people wanted Jesus to recreate was the miracle that happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness. Now, uh, on the slideshow here, I, I, I've got a quick, uh, another review or recap of this manna in the wilderness uh, instance from Exodus 16. Now, if you remember, uh, the children of Israel were liberated from Egyptian slavery, and it was spectacular. Remember the 10 plagues, remember them coming across the, the Red Sea and the sea opening up so that the children of Israel could walk across on dry land. You saw the Ten Commandments. It was a, it was a movie from what, the 80s, 90s? Everybody's seen this. Charlton Heston saying, let my people go. So after that point in time, after God had uh, delivered the Hebrew people, they were wandering freely, no longer slaves to the wilderness. And at some point, they began to murmur against both God and his leaders. Now, murmuring is important. Note that in the Hebrews' state of freedom, in the wilderness, learning God bit by bit and day by day, they murmured against God and his leaders because they ran out of food. You're going to start to see a theme here, how, how often folks are concerned with physical, natural food. 
when it's time to be concerned about a little bit more. Well, they murmured against God and against his leaders. And what God does is he responds. The, the people, these Hebrews, what they had done is they uh, began to speak in a um, uh, incognito manner about manner about their uh, uh, d- descent, about how God was handling things, about how Moses was handling things, because they didn't have food. And part of their speech, these, these Hebrews in their speech, what, what they were saying was that they, they literally wished that God had killed them in Egyptian slavery because at least then they had enough food. So God, he came up with a solution. You know, he didn't come down and do the clapback thing. He solved their problem. God caused the evaporating morning dew, the, the frost from off the ground to leave a um, uh, small uh, substance. It, it's called manna. Manna literally means like, what is this? Because the people had never seen it before. They called it, what is this? And in the Hebrew tongue, to our ear, it sounds like manna. And so we call it manna. And manna, this, this substance used and pulled off of, uh, off of the ground after the, uh, the morning dew had evaporated, was used to make bread. And so this is why the Hebrews, even to this day, and certainly in the time in which Jesus ministered, called it, called manna, the bread from heaven, because it was manna bread. The way we use flour to make bread or uh, whole wheat flour to make bread, and we call it wheat bread, they used this manna miraculously uh, 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 provided by God. They used this manna to make bread. And so they called manna itself bread from heaven. Jesus has to deal with this because in John 6, as part of our recap, his audience, Jesus' audience is saying, well, can you recreate manna? because they thought manna was the bread from heaven. And Jesus starts to articulate to them that manna was not the real bread from heaven. So by the time we get to verse 32 through 35, Jesus is telling them that no, no, manna was not the real bread from heaven. Manna though a miracle was just food that satisfied a person's natural and physical hunger. You know, we talked about this uh, in our last session. Uh, As a matter of fact, the old Uh, The Old Testament um, congregation of the Hebrews in Exodus 16, they ate manna. They ate it for 40 years, but they died. They died like every other human. They died after that. So that manna was only good, just like the food that we eat. It was only satisfying temporarily. And a couple hours later, you're going to have to get some more food. Well, Jesus is beginning to introduce the idea that there is a bread that is everlasting and there's a bread that can satisfy permanently. Now, at that, we start to see a little bit of contention. Verses 36 through 40, we see Jesus introducing uh, uh, concepts that they were not familiar with. Jesus, he's he's already proven himself, frankly. Let's take a break from our recap, and let's talk about this. Now, I told you, and you can read for yourself, that John 6 starts off with a miracle, with Jesus multiplying two small fish, puny fish, and five barley loaves of bread. Little boy's lunch. Well, for Jesus to multiply that to feed over 5,000 people, he would have already proven that he has power, not only over uh, nature, but over the laws that govern our existence. And now, the day after, the same people that ate of that bread and those fish are asking him, can you give us a sign to prove that you have a special type of power and that you're from God? Okay, well, uh, in in verses 36 through 40, Jesus begins to uh, line out some things. First of all, he tells the folks that that they've chosen not to believe. This is not a matter of uh, evidence not existing or evidence not being available or visible to them. This is a matter of the people choosing not to accept said name evidence, like two fish, five loaves of bread feeding over 5,000 people. And they're asking for some different type of miracle. They're asking for, uh, can you make manna for us? And in verse 37 through 40, Jesus is kind enough to not only tell us what his intentions are, but what his father's intentions are. And then finally, we can uh, conclude our recap. We find that Jesus starts to uh, lend way in his, in his teachings about the resurrection. We find that at the end of verse 40. So that's our lengthier recap. You know, it's been a, a little while since our last lesson. I want to make sure you are somewhere near up to speed before we uh, get kicking with today's lesson. Today's lesson, of course, goes from 
verse 41 through 71 in John 6. So let's see, let me get my slideshow back up here. Okay, so verse 41, we begin to see this response of the people. Jesus is speaking, he's introduced some concepts. Uh, he, he's introduced the concept of uh, laboring or working for a sustaining and everlasting type of food. And uh, we see that he says that uh, the, the people should be believing on the person who God has sent, which is Jesus himself. Uh, we see that Jesus intends to raise some up at the last day and that uh, Jesus himself is uh, the one that, that has sent, as you were, God the Father is the one that has sent Jesus. Well, the response of the audience after hearing this stuff, this is new to them. And, and frankly, we'll find later in the study that this is one of the more difficult sermons that Jesus preached because many folks after they heard this sermon were not following Jesus anymore. We'll talk about that later. Verse 41 of John 6 has the audience and they start to do this thing called murmuring. Remember, murmur was the response of the Hebrews, the children of Israel as they were liberated from Egyptian slavery in Exodus 16, hundreds of years before. Now, here we go. We've got Jesus beginning to introduce new concepts and the people's response is to murmur. Now, murmur, let's let, let, let's get an understanding of this term murmur, uh, this verb murmur. In, in verse 41, 43, and, and, and 61 of John 6, what we have is the word murmur, and this is the verb. It's to mutter secretly, like to discontentedly complain. You know, the grumble under your breath, like when you really don't like something. You're like, I don't agree with this. I don't, with it. I, I, I don't, I don't know about all that. You know, you're grumbling under your breath. And what happens is when a number of people do that, it forms a kind of a muttering low sound. Like you can hear people saying stuff, but you can't make anything out. You just hear a lot of people talking on their breath, trying to hunch their neighbor and say, I don't know what you said. I'm not, I never heard nothing like that. I'm not with it. You know, so a lot of that murmuring is happen, happening. In Exodus 16, when we saw the word murmuring, what we're looking at is the people that they spent the night. That means they were up at night voicing their complaints in a low tone. They, they weren't sleeping that night. It was, a, you know, what we would call, you know, talking trash. I don't know what's going on with Moses later. Uh, he, he might be losing at this point. If we might have been with him. Yeah, I'm glad he got so easy. But uh, uh, at this point, I'm not really, you know, I, I'm with all this. You know, I'm not trying to starve out. I'm, 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 you know, that, that's, that's the muttering that happened in Exodus 16. Exodus 16, uh, verses seven through nine and verse 11, uh, the, the, the worst study would have us see that they piled up lofty grievances against Moses and of, of the Lord. They were stacking these rebuttals. They were building arguments that night about how uh, things were not properly run, how the Lord is not taking care of them, how them running out of food is probably a good sign that they're not supposed to be there, how Moses probably don't know what he's doing. Yeah, God helped him out at the Red Sea, but now we're out here starving. And if, if God was really with me, Moses, would we really be out here with no food? They were building up these grievances. So murmuring is an expression of discontent. As a matter of fact, the concise Oxford Dictionary would call murmuring a low continuous background noise. So they talking under their breath. And then of course you got the medical definitions of a murmur. A murmur is a sound made by the heart that indicates disease or damage. Noted. So that's murmuring. Now, Whenever we're looking at, at murmuring and, and what the folks uh, uh, had, had, had responded to Jesus with, uh, they murmured God and their murmuring, of course, was a protest to Jesus' claim that he came from heaven. Let's not just look at the response. Let's look at what triggered that response. The response was they murmured. What triggered the response? Jesus saying that he came from heaven. Verse 42 has the substance of what they were saying. In verse 42, we see that they start to call out and ask certain questions of each other because they're like, hold up. Now, I know we just said he come from heaven, but I know and you know, his daddy was Joseph and his mom was Mary. What are you talking about? You know, they were murmuring. Forgive me if you can't hear me, but I'm trying to illustrate murmuring because, you know, when you're talking to somebody that's, you know, this close shoulder to shoulder with you, that's how you talk when you don't want the main speaker to hear and you disagree and doubt what he's saying. And so uh, murmuring is what they did. And the way they murmured in verse 42 is 
they had some understanding of Jesus' parents and his background, and they figured because they had the incomplete knowledge of who Jesus came from, that there's no way he could actually be from heaven. You see, incomplete knowledge does not equate to divine revelation. Incomplete knowledge is a lot of times going to put you in the wrong space whenever you're trying to interpret what God is saying because you don't know everything. Incomplete knowledge is not having all the facts or not knowing everything. You know, it, it, it makes Jesus' claims and his message seem improbable. I'm telling you, I'm in constant contact with folks that are not believers, and they know a little bit from here, a little bit from history, a little bit from social media, a little bit about politics, a little bit uh, about family, a little bit about science. And these little bits are used as uh, 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 rebuttals to contradict the message of Jesus Christ. And, and, and they use these little bits of information, these improbable pieces of knowledge and information, and, and they allow it to uh, cast doubt on what Jesus has said. And the issue with that is, when God speaks, what he's providing is divine revelation, because in the mind of God is all knowledge. Why would you put incomplete knowledge that any individual human has against God's all knowledge. God provides divine revelation. And so uh, having or knowing the facts given by God is what divine revelation is. It's available to everyone that would read God's word to some degree. And here's a secret. I'm going to go ahead and put out there for you. Divine revelation, it, it increases as one's belief in God increases. That is to say, when you accept God's immediate revelation as plain as day in scripture, at that point, you begin to know God more and he begins to divinely reveal more to you about himself. So to the degree that you believe God's uh, uh, initial and general revelation, that is the degree to which God will continue to provide divine revelation. Well, these folks, they had incomplete knowledge about Jesus. They thought, well, we know his parents, so there's no way he could be from heaven. Sadly, Incomplete knowledge recalls Joseph as Jesus' only father, recalls Mary as having a natural conception to birth Jesus. But divine revelation that we have, because we have a, a, the entire New Testament to look at, recounts God publicly claiming Jesus as his beloved son, in whom God was well pleased. So the incomplete knowledge had Jesus as the only father, but divine revelation available through the gospels and through God's word points clearly to the fact that God the Father in heaven was the father of Jesus, uh, from which Jesus the Son of God was sent. Incomplete knowledge has Mary posed as having a natural conception. They thought they knew Mary, so they must have known that she had a natural conception in John 6, 42. However, divine revelation has uh, uh, Mary giving uh, birth in a supernatural way, from supernatural conception. We find that in Matthew 1, 18 and Luke 1, verses 26 through 35. So these are some of the factors that are, that are out there. We got to remember that whenever we don't have the full picture, our incomplete knowledge can cause us to doubt what God is saying if we rely on that incomplete knowledge. Remember, divine revelation is what's going to help us accept what God has said, and we can only get a greater level of that by believing what God has already said. So, as we move on in the text, by the time we get to verse 43 and we've seen that Jesus has already said, don't murmur, don't murmur, uh, after we've already looked at the audience to whom Jesus is speaking and we've noted their posture of disbelief and how they employed incomplete knowledge to question Jesus' message and cast doubt on it. We move on to a point where Jesus tells them to you, just calm, calm down. Don't murmur. Stop the murmuring. Stop your you know, quiet dissent that you're not saying out loud because you disagree with what I'm saying because you already disbelieve in my message. And Jesus goes on to talk about how no one can even get to God, that is to say, come to Jesus unless they are drawn by the Father. And that's something that should kind of trigger some questions in you, because it did in me. Uh, to say that uh, in verse 44 and 45, we find this concept of being drawn by the Father, and that's how folks come to Jesus. We have this idea that 
uh, in verse 45, the prophets of old have said that some would be taught by the Lord and some are going to learn about the Father. Let's look back onto the Old Testament prophets whom Jesus is quoting and see what the Old Testament prophets have said. Because Jesus in his response, telling the people to calm down, don't murmur, God, you disagree. He's starting to lean on scripture that was available at the time in the Old Testament prophets. So let's look at those. When Jesus says that some would be taught by the Father, he's referring to Isaiah 54 and 13. Isaiah 54 and 13 says, and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children. So Isaiah, in times of old preceding uh, Jesus's earthly ministry by uh, hundreds of years, Isaiah, in hearing from the Lord, he expressed the prophecy that at some point there would be children of God that would be taught of the Lord directly. And those people would have a great peace. And then Jesus also speaks about some learning about God the Father in between verses 34 and 35. Now, there's another prophet that talks about uh, a certain set of people that are learned of God the Father, or they learn about God the Father. Now, listen to this. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 through 34, reads as follows. It says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make. So God is making a promise and an agreement and a covenant. And he said, he's going to make it with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 34, Jeremiah 31 says, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Jesus is pulling on the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah in verse in chapter 31, verse 33. He's pulling that into his current response. And what Jeremiah has said in Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34, is that God has already decided long time ago to make a certain type of covenant with the house of Israel. And he said at a certain time, God is going to put his law on the insides of people. That There's not going to be a need to look at tablets of stone. There's not going to be a need to go and open up the books to figure out what God said, because God's going to put that law inside him. He's going to write this inside people's hearts. And at that point, God is going to be their God in a certain way. Not just uh, the God that would uh, hand them uh, uh, tablets of stone or hand them a piece of paper that said these are the rules. God's going to be the type of God to these people at a certain point that uh, 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 has put his law in their inward parts. It's inside them. And at that point, those people are going to go know God to a different degree. God says they're going to be my people. Verse 34 of Jeremiah 33 says that they're not going to need teachers. Because they're going to have a special and unique and intense knowledge of God themselves. It says, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, saying the Lord. It says, for I'm going to forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now, Jesus is calling on these prophecies because what he's saying is that it's written in the prophet that there's going to come a time when uh, folks are going to know about God the Father. And Jesus is posing this. Uh, in a way that uh, at the end of verse 45, he says, every man, therefore, that hath heard, that's to say, heard what Jesus said, and hath learned of the Father. That means they've come to know God in a unique way, according to what we see in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 through 34. It says, those people are going to come to me. Jesus is showing us that there are groups of people out there that aren't groups. They're the same group. The groups of people that Jesus is speaking about are the people that have heard, the end of verse 45, everyone that has heard. And then he talks about this group from way back in the reference in Jeremiah 31. It said the people that are going to know God. And then he says these folks are the same group, and these folks are going to come to Jesus. And so what we have to um, begin to understand from this particular reference of Jesus is that when Jesus is speaking, the Father is drawing. Jesus has, at this point, and will continue to do as we look through our study, Jesus has made it a point of focus to ensure that the credit for this salvation work is given to God the Father. 
Folks have asked Jesus, uh, why are you doing miracles on the Sabbath? And Jesus says, I do what my father does. Folks have asked Jesus, why are you teaching this way? Why are you saying that? And Jesus has said, and Jesus has said, I say what my father says, excuse that interruption. Jesus is now saying, when I speak, the father is drawing. And if the father is not drawing, if the father is not part of my sermon, if the father is not involved in my sermon, people won't come to me. And so that's why Jesus says, if the father doesn't draw you, you can't come to me. The only way somebody can come to Jesus is if the father draws him. Don't you remember later on, because a lot of us have read through the, the, the gospels, that uh, Peter is one who uh, would later on in Caesarea Philippi uh, make another confession about Jesus. And Jesus says, flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you, but my father in heaven. Jesus is making an indication that the coming to Jesus action is a result of the father's drunk. And Jesus is also indicating that when he's speaking, the father is drawing. The father to Jesus is always involved in his ministry. Remember, Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. The way to what? No one comes to the Father but by Jesus. And so this is what Jesus is indicating to the people, that they're murmuring, got it, you're murmuring. It's understood that uh, their murmuring at the time was a dissent and a, a, uh, a disagreement with Jesus. But Jesus is saying, if you are not responding to the Father's drawing, you're not going to be able to come anyway. So don't murmur. Don't disagree so bad. Well, we're at verse 46 at this point. Let me stop this sharing. Verse 46, Jesus tells them, of course, to stop murmuring. We've covered that. Uh, we've covered the father doing the drawing through Jesus speaking um, and how the father is doing the drawing through Jesus speaking is the only way folks can come to Jesus. Now, whenever we say come to Jesus or in the end of verse 45, when it says cometh to me. That word come means to move toward, you know, to get near something with regard to the belief, to get closer to a state or a condition. So whenever we have the, in 2021, this slang term, a come to Jesus moment, that is the moment at which you stop doing what you are doing and get closer to the purpose and the message of Jesus. That's what Jesus means by, by saying, uh, come to me. Now, uh, let, let me uh, keep kicking with here. Let's see, let's, please forgive me as I get, get my notes together. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we've covered at this point how the Father's invitation and the Father's drawing is always a part of Jesus speaking. And Jesus has already said, if the Father doesn't draw you, you can't come to me. Jesus, in speaking, is, is, is making it clear that though you hear me speaking, what's actually happening is there is a drawing of the Father. We need to also recognize what is implied. What is implied is that the hearer respond to the Father's drawing and Jesus speaking. Because how else can you come after being drawn? i tell you what I could do. Right now, uh, I have my wife in the house. I could call her with my words. And with my words, if she comes to me, I will have drawn her with my words. But if my wife is unwilling and unresponsive to my voice, then I will not have successfully drawn her. And so an essential uh, uh, element of the father drawing one and, and, and the, the, the effect being one coming to Jesus is that the person being drawn respond willingly with belief and with uh, a voluntary uh, uh, activity to where they move and respond to the drawing. And so this is the same thing. You know, Jesus is speaking to the people. He's telling, I'm telling you when I'm speaking to you, the Father's drawing you. But what is implied is that the audience back then, the same way as it is today, the audience is going to have to respond. And if the audience responds to the drawing of the Father and the words of Jesus, at that point, that person will come to Jesus. So Jesus says, if you're unwilling to come at me speaking, at the Father drawing, you don't need to murmur and do all this dissenting. Because only the ones that are implied, the only ones, only ones that are going to respond to the Father drawing and Jesus speaking are going to be able to come to me. 
So some of y'all, this isn't going to apply to because you've already chosen to disbelieve. Well, uh, verse 46, Jesus goes on to say, though he has referenced the prophets to articulate this idea of knowing God and being taught of God, he makes it clear that the only one that really, really like face to face, presence in presence, knows God the Father is, is Jesus. He says, not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God. He's seen the Father. That is to say, uh, the, the only person that's actually seen God full on, straight up uh, uh, in all of his glory is Jesus, because Jesus is the one that was sent from the Father's presence. It's just something I'm reminded of Moses, uh, one of God's uh, chosen leaders, actually the leader of uh, the children of Israel in Exodus 16, when we looked at that earlier, even Moses wanted to see more of God that he could. You know, Moses asked God if, if he could see his, uh, see his glory, see his face. And God uh, told him, you, you, you can't at this point. You, you, you know, we, uh, as Bible students, we look at it and we assume that you can't means your body physically cannot take it. And so Moses had to be put up in a high place inside of a rock. And God had to cover Moses while he was inside the cleft of a rock. And God passed by and allowed Moses to see his back. That's Moses, arguably um, second to Jesus, one of the most prominent and influential uh, God-fearing leaders in the entire Bible. And all he could see was Moses was God's back for a bit. And so Jesus is saying, don't, don't get this twisted. Uh, I, I do want to articulate to you that some folks are taught of God and have learned of God. There are some that are going to respond to the Father's drawing and respond to my words and come to me. But you need to understand there's only so much real knowledge of God you're going to have because the only one that knows God to the greatest degree is the one sent from God. And that is the person of Jesus. Well, after articulating this part, uh, Jesus goes on to talk about uh, God is the one, or Jesus is the one that has seen God and has uh, declared him. By the time we get to verse 47, Jesus begins to start with building on what he's already said, this living bread, and he begins to kind of hammer some things home, and he starts to put it very pointedly, and he begins to talk about everlasting life. If you remember, we talked about the manna bread earlier and how the manna bread was natural food. I mean, it, it, it arrived and, and appeared miraculously because the, the, the elements of the manna bread, the manna on the ground that was made into a dough that could be baked to uh, provide and, and be baked into manna bread, that was a miracle, but it was still regular food. You ate it and a couple of hours later, you had to eat more food. Well, in verse 47, Jesus starts to make it very, very clear that those that would believe on him, believe on Jesus, would have everlasting life. And in verse 48, we have it put even more plainly where Jesus says that I am the bread of life. He tells the folks that Jesus himself and his self-declaration is the one that can be consumed in a way to the point where he is an everlasting sustainment. Uh, Jesus is a, uh, a, a, a one that can be consumed for the purposes of gaining eternal life, not just a temporary life. I want for us to consider some, some things here, just so we can understand this as we wind down. In going back to verse 45, and I think we cover this pretty well, let me uh, try to walk us through this slide here. Uh, Jesus says this quote, he says, every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, he comes to me. Now, I told you without this vision that hearing Jesus is the drawing of the Father. And whenever one is willing to respond to Jesus' words and that drawing, that person is going to come to Jesus. All right. So let's break down this particular sentence or quote from Jesus. Jesus says, Every man, therefore, that hurt, hath heard um, is a reference to those that hear the words of Jesus. And whenever we see the therefore, as Dr. Prince would say, whenever you see a therefore, you need to figure out what it's there for. Uh, the therefore is a 
stepping stone because Jesus is building on a, uh, a concept of folks being taught by God directly and knowing God to a, a degree to which they don't need all these other teachers to go through, go to this school or that school. They're going to know God because God would put, according to Jeremiah chapter 31, his law in their hearts uh, and, and write it in their inward parts. Well, Jesus says, everyone that has heard of Jesus and has learned of the Father, equating Jesus' speech with the learning of God that's being put out there, uh, we got to consider that when Jesus says, ha says, hath learned of the Father, he's talking about those that have accepted and received Jesus' teachings because Jesus is coming from God the Father. When Jesus says that uh, those that have learned of the Father, he's speaking or that instance of being learned from the Father, he's speaking about folks that have chosen to absorb the knowledge that Jesus is putting out, because this knowledge comes again from God the Father, Jesus coming from God the Father. When Jesus says those that have learned of the Father, he's talking about those that have become educated to know Jesus' relationship with God the Father. He says these people that have heard his words and have learned of God the Father, those folks are going to come to me. That is to say, approaches and gets nearer Jesus' person, work, and message. Now, near the end of this, Jesus in verses 48 uh, talks about himself as the, the bread of life. And in verse 51, he talks about himself being the living bread. What we find is uh, Jesus says that his origin is actually heavenly. This is the thing that they murmured at earlier. But he restates it. He says in verse 50, this is the bread which comes down from heaven. He's talking about himself. He said he was the bread of life, is. And he says that anyone that eats of this type of bread is not going to die. All right. So this will be the last slide we look at. And this is where we'll wrap things up before we pray and cut it for today. Uh, I, I would ask that you would at least take a look at this. Uh, little spreadsheet graphic we have here. Now, most of us know a few things about um, uh, baking, like the bare bones basics. Like I'm not a, a serious cook. I am uh, by no means a baker, but I know you put a couple of things together into an oven and they should come up like bread or something like bread. You know, I feel like I could figure it out. I feel like I could Google it. I know there gotta be some eggs some flour, I don't know, a rolling pin, some sort of a, a pan. There's got to be an oven. That's a thing, right? There's got to be some flour. I know that much, but let's look at what we know about bread. And let's remember that Jesus has called himself not only the bread of life, but also the living bread. Let's remember that this entire time we've kind of been talking about bread, you know, because Jesus has used this understanding that every human in, in his audience, on, on this social media audience and, and the Bible has about bread, he's using that understanding, that understanding of physical sustenance to illustrate a spiritual truth. Jesus says that he is the living bread. He also says that he's the bread of life. Let's look at this. Well, if Jesus is trying to connect to our understanding, let's go in and figure out what we know about bread. Uh, white bread. Here we go. We know that white bread has a unique ingredient. That, that's why they call it white bread, all right? Uh, the, the unique ingredient has, it's white flour, a refined process, it's white flour. And the process is combine wet and dry ingredients and then bake it. You know, every type of bread listed here has a unique ingredient. They've got a baking process and it, it also has, uh, you know, an effect like a taste. You know, if you combine the ingredients according to the recipe and the process uh, described in the recipe, you're going to get a certain type of bread and it should taste a certain way and it should have a certain effect on your body. Well, white bread, you know, it's supposed to have a mild flavor. It's pretty good for peanut butter and jelly. Uh, temporary satisfaction. Whole wheat bread. It has a different special ingredient. Whole wheat flour. Combine the stuff, put it together, put it in the oven for the, the prescribed amount of time at the, at the uh, prescribed and described temperature, and you're going to get a different type of bread than the white bread because there's a different special ingredient. It's still temporary. It's going to satisfy your physical hunger. It's natural food. I mean, we appreciate it, but it's only going to be good for a couple hours before our bodies are going to need more. Well, the barley loaf that we talked about early, because we, we talked about two fish and five loaves of bread in chapter six, uh, those loaves of bread were barley loaves, not preferred. I don't know if y'all have ever had a piece of barley loaf, 
or a barley bread, it is not okay. You do not want to do this. This is the absolute last resort whenever it comes to getting a piece of bread. But the barley loaf comes from barley flour. Um, and, and, you know, from this young boy having barley loaves, maybe he wasn't uh, 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 one that could get, you know, the best type of bread, wheat bread at the time. We know they had wheat, but he had barley loaves. In any case, the barley loaf is going, you know, probably not going to taste great, great. It's dry compared to other breads, but it still satisfies you only temporarily. You don't eat any type of bread, any type of food, you're still going to die. And so all these types of bread, uh, they have a temporary satisfaction, a temporary type of nourishment and sustainment. Banana bread, same thing. What's the special ingredient in banana bread? Bananas. Bananas. Tastes great. Makes you feel good. Probably good for breakfast. The manna bread. We talked about manna bread. Manna, the special ingredient was manna. This is why they called it bread from heaven. They'd never seen manna before. But, but they combined the ingredients it took to make bread. They didn't have flour. They didn't have barley. They had manna in the wilderness. And they ate manna bread. And according to Exodus 16.31, it was sweet like honey wafers. But still, it was temporary satisfaction. It was natural food. And it didn't sustain them because the people that ate the manna bread still died. They still in the graves at some point. Well, Jesus has called on our understanding of bread to present himself as a different type of bread. He's presented himself as the living bread. And in verse 45, as you were, verse 551, he starts to tell us about this living bread. In verse 51, we find that the special and unique ingredient in the living bread, Jesus, is Jesus' flesh. Jesus' flesh and, and, and the baking process or the process by which we get the effect we want is Jesus is going to give up his flesh and die as a sacrifice for the whole world. Now, this just seemed to take a turn because Jesus has been building on concepts and we've been able to kind of walk it. But if you can imagine, this audience is barely holding on whenever he's talking about bread and eternal satisfaction. And now Jesus is introducing the idea that he is living bread that's going to give up himself as a sacrifice for the world. And Jesus goes on to intimate to us that in Jesus giving up his flesh for the world, the effect is going to be that Jesus exchanges his life for the world's death. That the world is gonna have life because he has died for the world. That eternal life is gonna be available to the world through Jesus. And he says, when this happens, the effect of consuming the living bread, the effect of one accepting and receiving Jesus into their life, is going to be that they're going to have a permanent satisfaction to their spiritual hunger for God. That's what the spirit yearns for. Relationship and closeness and restoration of proximity to God, being in right standing with God, because God is not only love, but he is life. If you remember how God has described himself to Moses at that burning bush experience, he said, God says that he is the I am that I am. He is the existence. Um, we find that uh, Jesus elsewhere in scripture is, is described as the one that was responsible for all creation. And so when one wants to have everlasting life, one has to link up with God. And Jesus is saying that he is the living bread and that in giving up his flesh, the special ingredient, he's going to link us back up with God because he's going to die on our behalf, giving us life. Jesus is the living bread. Not like all these other types of bread, white bread, whole wheat bread, banana bread, barley bread, manna bread. All those breads are still going to land you in a grave. Because once you stop eating, once your body can stop, has to stop processing the limited and uh, 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 temporary uh, nutrients that are in that, I mean, you're going to run out of energy. You're going to run out of sustenance. You're going to have to continue to eat. And when the bread runs out or your body runs out, you're done. Jesus says, by eating the living bread, the effect of consuming the living bread, consuming Jesus' message, listening, accepting his word, is that you're going to live forever, and he's going to raise us. So that is verses 41 through 51 of John 6. We'll probably get another video in here within the next 48 hours. And I'll try to post it uh, quickly so that you can piece these two pieces together. We are still not at the end of this sermon that Jesus is giving. 
but we're going to stop here. Let's pray out. Our Father and our God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the living bread that we can consume and have eternal life, that we can uh, have and get closer to you in eternity, that we can be in right standing with you by accepting the words of Jesus, by willingly responding to what Jesus told us, thereby responding to the drawing of God and coming to him, coming to Jesus, who is the way to the Father. Thank you so much for your love and your grace. Thank you for this opportunity that is in front of us. Everyone that has not believed has the opportunity to come to you through Jesus. Thank you for making this opportunity available. Thank you so much for speaking to us through your word. Please be with us uh, tonight. Grant us uh, traveling mercies for those traveling. Grant us uh, your grace for those of us that are uh, still grieving uh, the loss of loved ones. Grant us healing for those of us that are continually praying for those that are infirmed. Uh, we ask that you continue to be the God that only you could be. You are so good that we have no earthly comparison uh, to whom we can uh, draw any sort of comparison. Lord, we thank you, oh God. You are the highest of highs, the greatest of the great, oh God. You are uh, the uh, love itself. You are life itself, and we appreciate you. Uh, thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen.